All right, so this is... Like a, I didn't never see that it gives me like a, this is being recorded. Are you consenting to this? There must be some uh, deep down, yeah, like everyone's aware, <laughs> recording, this is going to be public. Uh, but this is the uh, Think Movement business chat number one. Um, something that has come up along the way is like how people who are really good at their craft and just like want to put their time and energy into their craft may or may not in our case mostly have struggled with the business side um, because putting a price on things is kind of like a firewall to working with people in some way so how do we allow ourselves to be valued for our services make a living at this and continue to do it in the way that we would like to do it where it's like product first and hopefully not like having to learn all that business stuff without the content, without the stuff. Um, so uh, it is myself, Chris Ruffalo. Uh, we have Jeremy Sanders here and Jen Pilati. Uh, we're just going to flip around real quick. Uh, Jeremy, first job and what age? Oh man, my first job, I believe I was... 17 and it was like two jobs two summer jobs it was one was uh sonic drive-in uh okay. and then the second job was i was starting to learn how to teach gymnastics as well so since those were like my two things since i was already moving and stuff like that um but prior to like getting his obviously making parkour a career um food service or like being a chef was what i thought i wanted to do so uh i was going all in but yeah sonic sonic drive-in <laughs> okay, okay. And Jen? Um, my first job, I was 12, and I was a tutor. Okay. Oh, that's cool. Wow, yeah. nice. So that was, <laughs> that's interesting. Like, man, I, I used to, I remember I used to, like, scam guys at the park playing basketball, but you're like, you know what, I'll write that paper. And oh, I was yeah. like, this is exactly me. I'm like, here's my paper. Go ahead. Like, ah, Jen, <laughs> I was so behind for so long. Okay, <laughs> tutor. Uh, I was 16. And I worked at a 31 Flavors Baskin Robbins. And that was my, oh. that was my first gig. Nice. I guess food industry. Build those forearms up, get free ice cream. Yeah, literally, it was just like the one and it would be <laughs> sticky. But yeah, it was like, you eat ice cream in the back while we're waiting for people in the middle of winter. Like, I could do this gig. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so that's first job. Let's chat. First time you, and this might be this, similar to you, Jeremy, that, but you just said, the first time you worked for someone else in this industry. So your first mm. entry into like the movement realm. Yeah, I guess it's yeah a bit similar because I, I moved to a, a different city for the summer and um, it was because this uh, gymnastics gym that I had trained at before and had friends that worked there um, was where I wanted to start learning how to teach. So even before I since there was no real like parkour centered information um all of my stuff was like relegated to trial and error but then I was looking for you know like analogous things to to reach out towards and since I had some gymnastics coach friends um that's just where I naturally went um martial arts and into gymnastics as far as like teaching goes since I wanted to like learn the flips and learn how to teach the flips as well so I was uh I was just like like an intern I guess there can't remember i think they paid me i can't even remember but... <laughs> that's what i mean we're like don't you just want to do the thing what yeah. was your what what was your specific um kind of following up your specific entry mm -hmm. point into teaching parkour when was your first mm -hmm. like how what was your first round on like that being the identity and like i see i think the first so it was around 2008 i believe and um primarily because at that time i had been uh, sponsored by case with uh case with with my team uh uh under american parkour this uh company and uh we were i was a performer mostly but uh, at some of the things we were doing like workshops too so i would say like technically that was my first so like one-off little workshops where you're pretty much like not teaching so much as you are um just making sure that they're doing it safe enough you know that they're not gonna like die or anything like that Okay. And I would say that's like the first professional one. But before that, you know, like, as with anything, if you like, if we're training together, like we're learning from each other and we're like sharing stuff, mm -hmm. maybe you get something, you know, you have a, a easier grasp of something than I do or vice versa. And we can like, have that like little uh, knowledge share. So I mean, that that was like a natural thing. So I don't count that. But uh, 
yeah, I think 2008 little like one off like workshop performance combos would be like the first kind of teaching thing. But I, yeah. And that was through, you said the, the parkour team that you were on? Yeah. So, yeah. So American parkour, the, the tribe was the name of the team. And um, yeah, so we would do mostly performance, but for performances, but every once in a while, like we went, uh, did one in India, we did one in Lebanon, where we did a performance, and then we would run little workshops with the people there. So it literally, like, I think of like, NBA ambassadors, you, you basically, you kind of wanted to show off how cool it was. And then you're like, come and try. Like, yeah, you can do this too. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, I kind of personally, I like this stage of this question. So Jen, same thing. So first entry into like paid in the movement world, and then um, into like who you first worked for, I guess, doing the thing you wanted to do specifically. So I can't fully remember the timeline. My college was very, very busy, but I, at one point I had three jobs in fitness. So oh, I was, <laughs> I was working at a corporate site, like teaching classes and doing their newsletter and doing a little bit of the managerial stuff. And then I was working at a gym, teaching spin and boot camp and doing one-on-one -on -one sessions. And then I was also working in a lab, um, doing with people who had just lost significant amounts of weight. And I was teaching like strength programming and observing like heart rate trends on the treadmill to make sure everybody was safe. But then I was also waitressing because I had to pay my bills somehow, which should have told me everything I needed to know about <laughs> that should have been like, <laughs> I know I am, yeah, I am trying to wrap my head around right now, Jen, the boot camp spin instructor days. And I'm <laughs> like, and I, and I, it's wild because I totally get it. I totally get it. But at the same time, like, I don't think so much, I was just like, what? Like, um, and it's great because again, it shows like, it shows kind of the wheel of like, hey, what are people out there doing? What do they like? Like find an entry point. And then from there, make your way into like your thing. Okay. Yeah. Because then after that, when I graduated from college, I was recruited by a country club. And so at the country club, I taught, well, I did primarily one-on-ones, but then I also taught spin still, and I taught some like strength and mobility stuff. Okay. So, so you would say that country club is like, you're on ret retainer to work with their people. In some it was, ways. I mean, they employed me 40 hours a week. They gave me benefits, whole bit. Like it was great. Okay. So yeah. you, that's what I mean. You didn't have to worry about getting clients. It nope. was like, this is jet. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. Great. Very cool. Yeah. Um, I like this is going. Okay. So uh, myself, uh, so I graduated college, moved out to Oregon and was like, look at this degree. And they're like, we don't care. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so like, you know, so th similar. I was like, I just stocked shelves at Target. I'm like, this makes money. Um, but eventually all my, to like all the fitness gyms, cause you, you go where the, the gyms are, that makes sense. Um, uh, uh, two of them, Actually, one of them, the, the oldest in town, started, no, I, I take that two, started to, like, eventually got back to me months later. And, of course, like, Gold's made me, like, a person, you know, Gold's was, like, personal trainer. Um, and then this other place called Flex was, like, you can have our seniors. And I was, like, okay, I'll take, like, I am never, there's no, I'm, like, give me the trash. Like, I'm going to make something beautiful. Out of oh, anyway. God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I am. Um, but the Gold's, I remember, like, why I was like, I can't do this anymore was they like wanted you, they trained you like how to like grab body fat and like what to say oh, yeah. and how to make people feel mm. bad. And I was like, oh, I no. don't want to. So I left that job pretty quickly. And I, I was one of those things where it's literally like PE right now. We are like, this is what we're doing. And I'm like, that's awful. Like, I just like, I go <laughs> to the meeting and I nod and then I just do my own thing. Um, so I basically just stuck with the seniors. And it was this thing where they're like, like they were so happy to see me and you're like, get off the chair and they're getting off the chair. And you're like, yeah, so like that became like, I think of that as like spin boot camp. Like that was all we needed to do. Like, I don't know that they're happy, you know, we're interacting. Um, so that was my first entry into like the fitness world. And just like you guys, my backside of all this, my, because need to be, I need something stable. That's just kind of how I am was I was working in a group home. Um, it was like, it was, uh, like it became a daily hourly wage. And then 
what allowed me to go back to school for teaching, which is how I figured out what I wanted to do. I used to like, basically I started at Friday at 8 a.m. And then I stayed in the house with the guys. Um, and this is like, you give them their meds, you like wash them, feed that, like all that kind of, you literally take care of them. And then I would leave Sunday at 10 p.m. And I got my 40 hours with benefits oh. so I could go to school during the rest of the week and then figure out like try to get some training in here and there. Yeah. That's okay. Nice. Yeah. Um, so making ends meet, this is kind of like the story of everyone. <laughs> how, how and when did you decide to shift over into doing your own thing and feel free to do another stop gap of another job that transitioned. Uh, we'll just kind of follow the same pattern. So Jeremy becoming your own business owner. Cool. Uh, so in, so yeah, 2008, I started doing like performance stuff, mostly then a little bit of teaching. And then in 2009, um, American parkour started doing like franchises of it's like gym that it had in, uh, DC, Washington, DC. And then, so he offered the, the head guy there, Mark, um, he offered to go, there was a couple locations. So he'd fly down, he'd help you build some obstacles and stuff like that and get set up or whatever. So we were doing like a profit share with a gymnastics gym in San Antonio at the time. And, um, so it started off as that, um, and I think I was affiliated with them for maybe like three ish years or something. And at first it was a good time for me. Cause I was getting into it like 18 or something, but I was like, he helped me get started, but I didn't really have any idea what I was doing. And he obviously was mostly having to handle the business in, um, in, uh, in DC. So even though it like kind of gets you started, there's still not that much as far as like support <laughs> throughout. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I'm like flybird mm, failing, <laughs> exactly failing a lot. Um, you know, doing the food service stuff on the side, and then eventually in 2012, um, I ended up leaving American Parkour for some personal differences at the time, um, and so I made like Parkour SA for San Antonio, and I believe it was yeah that year might have been a couple of years before because it after maybe 2009 started being able to make a profit and it was like not much but it was like doubling every year and then um it happened around 2012 where I was like okay I'm working minimum 40 usually like 60 hours a week at this like as a uh, pastry chef at this private club and I'm you know making this amount obviously but the the work I mean the there was what's the word there was uh, good benefits and all that kind of stability. stuff too, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, stability. There you go. Thanks. Um, and then I was like, okay, but I'm only able to really devote like 10 hours of my life right now to my, my parkour teaching stuff. And that's making like 90% of what I'm, you know, making right now with the, with the, with the cooking stuff. So I was like, I should just like take that little leap and, and put more time in <laughs> and so it was around then that I decided to just drop it and I didn't do it in that good of a way either like I <laughs> didn't even give like a two-week notice like I should have at least given a two-week notice because nothing would have changed but I was like yeah I, I can't do this anymore I was, I was not going through like yeah, yeah I was not going through that emotionally good of a time and so in real what I realized in hindsight was it was my relationship that was really giving me the like unhappiness mm -hmm. but I was like maybe I'm unhappy with this you know so I was like okay no well, more forget that yeah I'm already <laughs> I can make the gym thing or the teaching thing work um but but it was a good step you know it was a good step so could you could you please you you mentioned I was failing could you define mm -hmm. what that means to you like uh mm -hmm. at your first go rounds so like in the beginning I didn't even have enough wasn't didn't have enough students to pay I could either choose between rent for the gym or rent for the a place for me to live. And so at the beginning, like I didn't even have, it was not sustainable for me. So like I wasn't even making enough money to, to afford my own stuff. So I was just, and then secondarily, like with, you know, with parkour, I'm blessed. And especially with like the way the permitting and stuff like that was super lax in San Antonio at the time. Uh, I, you know, it made sense perfectly with parkour to do outdoor classes. And we did do those, 
but I jumped too soon into doing uh, into my own space. Like there was no need for that. I should have just stayed with the outdoor classes only because anyway, it fits, it's more with my style and what I like to do anyway. Um, mm -hmm. And then invest in like the gym just a little bit later. So like if I would have delayed that a bit, but um, you know, just things like that. And then also I would say just understanding um, a little bit more first trying to do like all of the uh, understanding the marketing and stuff like that, not knowing which, you know, was the best kind of method to go for, which can vary city to city and place to place and your demographic and stuff. So eventually I, started going to like they had free small business development classes or whatever at mm. the college that I had went to so I started doing those to kind of just help me be like I don't know how to market this thing I don't know how to you know mm -hmm. da, 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 da. and um and then just things like that do research and get you know better client management system since it was just me and I didn't want to do all the admin of like keeping all my students up to date and all that kind of stuff um or messaging all of them if they're Thing was due uh if their tuition was due or anything like that so just learning these types of things because eventually originally it was like me just handling it and it's like how do I offload this type of stuff to mm. to make that but I think the biggest like mistake was just investing too soon in something that like was not necessary especially like with something like parkour so if I would have done it again maybe I would have like not done the not tried to rush into a gym space and let myself continue developing the outdoor classes but yeah Okay, so if I if I'm going to like make an asterisk for the mm -hmm. listeners, it would be like take advantage of free resources around you. Like yeah, yeah for sure. Just point blank. Again, owning mm -hmm. something doesn't necessarily make it a better thing, especially when you are the thing. So yeah. Okay. Cool. And there's, and there's tons of resources in people's cities for things like small business development and things like that. So like, don't be afraid to reach out and ask for help. And um, I know it feels weird because like especially like I went from that, like you were talking about struggling with that feeling of like even charging to do this thing that I like learned how to do for free, you know, mm -hmm. um, which is like a whole nother thing, but it's like realizing that, uh, you know, the economy all works together. And if you want to be part of like this community that you're in the city that you're in, that ideally like thriving local businesses is a good part of that. And there's going to be um, resources that, you know, people are just there. That's what they, they want to help promote. So like definitely look for them and and don't be afraid to to take part. And I mean, in things like this, like that's another reason why I wanted to be involved in this talk because I feel like it's going to be a good, uh, nice to hear y'all's stories and nice to do that little bit of brainstorming to get the wheels turning, right? Yeah, even, um, and, and definitely the classes and like I said, giving back like you're giving back, but also like the actual site and environment like public parks, mm. like you're saying, no one's going to typically, unless you go berserk, no one's yeah. going to, you know, be charging you. So again, bring mm -hmm. it outside, particularly if that's how your art yeah. form works. Mm -hmm. Jen, same question. So we're going to notice a theme with me. I don't know how many of these we will do, but we all know. Is it about being things. busy? <laughs> Is it about being busy? <laughs> <laughs> well, the busy thing, that's just, that's just me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but in 2007, actually it started in like 2006, I was really frustrated with the industry. <laughs> I'd only been doing it for like four and a half years that I was like, I'd been in my full-time job from 2002 to 2006, 2000. It, and then, so I started to get really frustrated and I was like, what can I do instead? So I started to look at different, like business avenues. I was like, maybe I could be a grant writer. Maybe I could like what, could, but I had such a hard time seeing myself sitting at a desk all day and not helping people in some way. I was having a really tough time with that. So as I started to like apply for stuff, I applied for Google. I got an interview actually. Um, and that was actually for their corporate fitness stuff. Yeah, I obviously okay. was not chosen. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Put in the door, but, put in the door. But in the door. But, and the, my boss at the time knew I was kind of looking and he decided to open his own gym. And he approached me and said, would you have any interest in going out on your own? He's like, you know, you'll be renting space from me. You get your clients. You'll be doing all the business stuff. You, you Like you'll have full autonomy. And I thought, well, I'm not doing anything else. So why not? So that was kind of how it started. And I built up a really good clientele. I still have some of those clients today at the country club. So I had some clients that followed me, but 
then I was stuck. I had no idea what to do. I had no idea how to get more clients. I had no idea like how to promote myself. I was really shy and insecure. And yeah, that was actually how the writing stuff started. And when I went Mm. back to graduate school and all of that was in that period, because I was like, I need to have better confidence. I need to have a better skill set and I need to have something stronger to offer. So that was, that was how that all came to be. Okay. So uh, interesting. I go back to that like 12 year old tutor and, and it's, I just see Jen being like, okay, your brain's the thing, right? Like go back to school, <laughs> get this thing working and then it's all going to work out. And that's like, we'll follow up in here later. Like it has. So, okay. Really cool. Um, so if I take myself, so Basically, I started teaching and I got my uh, master's of teaching while I was doing that like weekend group home um, gig. Uh, 2003, uh, I graduated and was like, I hope this works out. And uh, in August of that year, like I went back, like, again, put did some interviews, uh, went back home and I was like, oh, I don't know, I guess I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. And then I get a call from our athletic director for is like you got the gig so then I started teaching PE now that I'm teaching PE I was like well I have all the people um and and of course I didn't know what I was doing I was like what are these other dudes doing I'm like oh just do that okay uh which you know it always takes time to get into your own but um I had the benefits I had the stability so in general I kind of let uh the training stuff go because I didn't need it I also at this time was dealing with my own set of injuries. So I was just like, I'm going to do the school gig and then I'm going to figure out this body stuff because, you know, ACL surgery, I cannot do what I once did. And I am dissatisfied with people being like, you're fine. I'm like, I'm not fine. So that's when I started down this road. Now, the weirdest, wildest story of like how I actually got back into it is during all this, acup- I was do- doing all the things. So I had the insurance. I was like, pay them, pay them. Um, so I was getting <laughs> acupuncture. I was getting massage. I was getting chiropractic. And my chiropractor at the time, you know, we would, he would be on the table. We'd be chatting. And, he, you know, he'd be asking me, like, how my little journey was going. And I would tell him. And he's like, I'm literally on his table. And he's like, you should work for me. I'm looking to get some, like, exercise scientists or whatever he called them in. And I was, like, literally on his table, like, really? He's like, yeah. So I'm like, oh, okay. Two days later, he like shoots me his credit card information via email and was like, this is like literally happened. It was like, get what you <laughs> need. And, and at this time he was in an, like an office building. Oh so gosh. it was like, yeah, it was Amazing. kind of this, kind of, think of like, mm, it's like my living room space. So it's just like in an office building. So what, what do you want to get? And so I like used it and ordered some things. And then I started like, literally seeing people on like through him at the gym a couple hours a week and how this all kind of went down uh it started out very basic but then he I didn't at the time uh he was like this is your salary and he's like basically you're going to get 30 percent of what insurance pays and this is when I figured out like oh dang like car accidents like they get double triple so it, it was like this weird it became this weird thing of like were you in a, and were you in a car accident? Like you wanted to know so you could like star those people because you would get paid more and like moving back. So it eventually came out, right? So he, he eventually had a slew of massage therapists, a, a slew of exercise people. I just happened to be his first, but I was only around a little bit of time. So he started getting other people. Then he realized if we all got our chiropractic assistance license, which he paid for, like we we are basically an extension of him and now we get his money so what started happening again is still 30 percent but so and my rate this is how i established like the rate to start with was 65 dollars. i'm like 65 dollars an hour like this is pretty legitimate this is like Mm -hmm. so that is basically how i figured out you know what i eventually branched on my own what to pay um and i would have just honestly kept doing that gig because there was no risk i got people Until one day in 2019, in December, (laughs) I went to go to work and there were chains on the doors. And Uh that place is still, by the way, locked down. And I was like, oh, and apparently there were all these like terrible insurance and people were like taking equipment in the middle of the night. But I was, you know, there a couple hours Uh a week. And I just was like, oh, this isn't a thing anymore. 
So, and this is the weird thing about timing and opportunity. This is, again, this was December of 20, actually, I think that 2018 when this went down. And I'm looking at my garage full of like dusted tools. And I'm like, I don't think I need this. Stuff. Like I can put this into a space. Mm-hmm. So I converted my garage to this little like studio. And then like COVID hits. And I'm like, again, like you don't, like all the gyms shut down. And so you you recognize like, oh, okay. Not only is it the space the community could use, but like it's space that I can use to train people. And my beginning rate was still, I was like, this seems reasonable. It was that $65 an hour. So it was like a long throughout story, but that's how I, again, it only, I only made these pivots kind of because I had to, because the opportunity I had closed and I was like, well, again, it's my, I don't have to pay rent. It's my house. Plus I love Mm -hmm. spaces. I love my own spaces. So I ended up using it myself. Um, And maybe this is a good segue kind of going back. What was the first rate that you charged people to work with you that you had to come up with on your own? Do you remember, Jeremy? Uh, I don't remember private lesson-wise because we were mostly doing group classes at the time, but uh, it didn't change much differently, but it might have been because um, I, I think at the at the suggestion of the, what's the word, the, the business management stuff that we were doing, like I did like my due di- diligence and started looking at like, you know, our kind of like secondary and tertiary, like, uh, like uh, competitors since there wasn't any mm-hmm. other park origins, mm-hmm. but like things like gymnastics or whatever and stuff like that. So I think we started off at like $60 for a month. Uh, so it was like $15 class or something. And then um, shortly after, I think 80 was like our 80 for like a month of one class a week was like our classic type thing. And then um, started realizing like ideally uh, for, our retention and stuff like that because we were kind of like trying to find that sweet spot and we were like well once a week is really not that great for like their progress and like their progress is kind of going to be like something that's more self-fulfilling with the retention as well so I think we priced I think we might have priced that oh that's what it was so it was 60 and then we bumped it up to 80 and then I think we bumped our two a week down to like 120 or something like that so that was like the new 60 type thing Mm. for two times a week and that ended up like helping us out a ton so that was an interesting type of thing but I think I learned from like Chipotle or something like this I think I read something talking about Chipotle where they were like I think they were talking about their pork or something but the point was different where they were like you can charge a little bit more if what you have is better but then I was like okay well if I want to like you can price somebody out of the option that you don't necessarily want them to go. And then it's also good for you because it's kind of like, how much, how much do you really want to like have somebody pay to do the thing that maybe you don't really want to do, you know? So like two yeah. week is way better for, uh, for me and for other practitioners. So it kind of went there now, but I, yeah, I believe it was like 80 for a week. And I think maybe my private lessons were like 40 or 50 an hour or something like that. Okay. So um, kind of more so a class entry, like you use the class to kind of eventually, okay. Uh, And Jen? When I went on my, out on my own, it was 70 an hour is what I started at. And how did you, again, did you kind of look around? Man, I like never look around. That's my problem. But like, so I I did a lot of market research and I was charging because they had a bunch of packages, the country club I was working at. So, you know, like Mm. devalues, it's so funny. Like why, Mm. Why should it cost less if you're doing 10 versus one? I never understood that. So um, I think we were charging like 60 an hour for like the package, like if you bought 10 at a time or whatever. And it was Mm -hmm. 75 if you were doing just a one-off session. So I had that like, yeah. Right on. Yeah, that's the the thing. It's kind of like, again, it feels sleazy. Like I got them for 10, you know, but at this like, isn't one and that's the other thing that personally mm-hmm. is like I don't in my again a, a, away from the PE realm where I get them every day and like that kind of thing like I don't necessarily want to keep you guys as clients like I because it, it all it all kind of shifted to like pain relief um and and that kind of guides and like I want to like fix you and get you out like um so working with that uh 
yeah, and that's the other like sustainable, like you, like you said, Jen, you like you still have clients from that time, and it's like I think about like the young boy that I've been working with for three years, and a, a big part of the working with someone that long is like how to take care of them, and also like how to teach them to figure out what they like and try things. It really is like rearing. Like I feel like. Same thing in PE, same thing with these, like, I feel like I'm raising, I'm helping to raise these children that aren't mine. I have a punch in a punch out, which is very important. Um, but it is, it's, it's just a very wild ocean. Like even, even the premise that I'm not sure it was like, um, here's this young boy and he never crawled and he, there's some motor pattern stuff going on. I'm like, okay, cool. And then, you know, we started working and that's, Hey, he also has this little sister. Do you, do you want to take her too? And I was like, okay. So uh, it's it's it is the same in P of these very able bodied like I want to be at this level thrown in the same kind of like I mean, perhaps like a class environment thrown in the same with like mm-hmm. unable bodies and there's one of you and there's one space <clears throat> so it's like how do I give everyone what they need uh, which is always very when it's that's why I'm like when it's one on one like mm-hmm. this is gonna be yeah. such cake because like my attention's on one person one thing how they're feeling at that time. Um, cool. Okay. So if we then fast forward from this point, you're making your own business. Again, there's lots of trial and error. Where would you say, and you don't have to tell that necessarily this story, but where are you right now in your current business? What are the things that are providing you income and where do you hope it goes? Like, where do you, where do you project out in you know, I don't want to say five years, that seems like too far away, but like within, within two to three years, what are you hoping that your daily looks like? Gotcha. Well, so right now, mostly um, it's like a combination of my like summer or like work gigs. So like I might go to work in Dubai for like one to three months. And then usually in the summer, they'll be traveling in the U S and, and teaching all summer um and that income is enough to usually finance like half of my year's living you know it was it was actually once the whole year once upon a time Mm. here but um it's yeah it's gone down so norm maybe like let's say six months if we're being generous um and the rest is just doing private lessons and, and stuff like that and then the goal um since i have the online resource explore parkour is to try to have that i would love for that to be the the like 50 percent, i guess of my yearly income that the the traveling teaching stuff is currently and so i'm hoping um you know every year to try to like double the membership a little bit uh double the membership at least um and I think that'll, and we're also doing the other side of it too, where we are trying to see where we can cut costs and things like that with like web hosting and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's that's the goal, I would hope in, in like two or three years, that'll be able to be half of what I'm making just from subscribers. But then I also am hoping that it will be at a certain point with the brand that we'll be able to travel to consult with other gyms or do workshops and things like that. And then if I am traveling for like a longer term thing, it's more by choice than by necessity. Okay. So uh, I I think it would be succinct to say that basically you you have a seasonal job where you like Mm -hmm. really put a lot of time in these condensed and then you have like more off periods and those off periods you do one-on-ones, but really trying to use that time and energy to figure out how to support the business the yeah exactly and slight plug explore parkour guys is a, is a parkour resource and it's literally two dollars a month so <laughs> it might come up to three oh, it's gonna it's if you're, it's if gonna you're be in the three US, soon. No. like i know <laughs> if you're it's three dollars i'm not doing this like you know cup of coffee a day thing i'm not even gonna say that but <laughs> what you get for three dollars is insane so something to kind of put out there um Thanks. You, so it's interesting too, like the desire is to 
I think about, I think you call it American parkour, which in my head, I think American gladiators, mm -hmm. but just switch parkour at the end. <laughs> but you do this, like, basically, how do you develop your own brand with your mm -hmm. own quality so that that becomes the thing? And it no longer has to just be like Jeremy working one on one and like killing himself, trying to mm -hmm. like work with all these individuals in real time. I think another step that is super important, and I know both of you have really engaged with um, is that developing partnerships. Uh, so I know, for example, your explore parkour is with another person. Um, you mm -hmm. have a partner in it so that this big mega business thing doesn't just fall on you. Do you want, do you want yeah, to talk so about that at all? How that in the beginning, it was like, it was, so it was my idea, something that I had when I was uh, working with uh, Parkour DXP, this other parkour uh, company that I, uh, was helped them build uh, up a bit. I was like their first employee. Um, and originally it was something that I actually wanted to do with them because I know they were trying to, just to look for different avenues and, and, and ways to, to expand and, um, and uh, explore parkour <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and the business side of it. But um, it was just not something that they were able to do. Their business model at the time was currently um, just uh, working with the private schools in Dubai as an after-school program, um, and that's that's and there was a little, their academy was still growing and building, but the lion's share was from that stuff, and uh, they just couldn't give me any extra time away to try to develop this thing, and so uh, that was one of the one of the only reasons why I left. Actually, um, I mean, it's also it was a it was a tough work life schedule as well. You kind of had to like be on it 100% of the time. Um, otherwise, you're just not going to do what you want to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but uh, so yeah, in 2019, I left for that. Um, I left Dubai and started working on this project. I didn't have any website development experience or practice or anything like that. And um, started developing it on my own. Um, and then maybe a year and a half maybe a year, year, year and a half, uh, one of the other guys from uh, Dubai, who I ended up befriending a lot, uh, Pedro, he um, just heard about the project and was super interested in being involved. And since we worked and taught together for two years, I felt like he really kind of understood uh, my process and the way that I was trying to, to make this happen. And so since prior to that, all of the, like neither of us are web developers, so they didn't really, you know, we're both learning that part together, but he at least understood uh, the way I wanted the content to be delivered and um, and would be able to, you know, help deliver it. So he was doing a ton of help on the, the content creation side of things. So, you know, we'd create the plans for a technical page or a physical page, for example. And, you know, now the, the shooting and the filming and the editing and all that stuff could be split between us. And, um, mm -hmm. and then he was also handling... Um, all the Portuguese translation of everything since another big aspect of the website is to try to get rid of the potential language barrier for learning parkour mm -hmm. and try to get it translated as many different languages by parkour practitioners as possible so um, you really like that part too because like in parkour the it's a pretty eurocentric like world community and there's lots of other communities that are thankfully getting more um, more noticed slowly but uh, but they're still limited by the fact that they you know that English people aren't don't know Portuguese or they don't know Farsi or something like that. So for example, like in Brazil, there's tons of like really cool parkour events going on all the time. But like I you know nobody gets to hear about them because I think they're primarily um, just advertised towards uh, you know the Brazilian mm. country, which is huge anyway. So they don't really need to like get much international interest. But it's like there's you know, it's a huge thriving community there that on the world stage isn't as, um, just isn't as known about as I think it, as, as it could be. And so um, it's just one of those things to try to help also that side of stuff too. But um, yeah, I think I answered the question. I got a little. Yeah, no, annoyed. for sure. So I, I think that's a, the idea of like recognizing access, you know, you talked about the cost mm, and, the, and yeah. the language and that's so, that's so huge. Um, but again, to kind of create this resource that people can partake of at any time, um, 
and to have that partnership to help you in that process so you don't feel like you're alone in it. Uh, yeah. If I kick it back to you, Jen, maybe some partnerships on the way that have led you to where you are. Um, and I know you got 8 trillion things, but feel free to list them uh, going on. <laughs> um, and then where do you hope to be in two to three years? So a lot of my work has been um, solo because I owned a gym for 10 years, which finally ended in July. So I don't have that overhead hanging over my head, which is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and that's then, why they call it overhead I know <laughs> <laughs> like just sits there it's like oh uh, <laughs> I owe how much for PG&E uh, yeah exactly. <laughs> but in the midst of stuff um, I have partnered with a couple of different people and that's been really great just because I'm really good at getting stuff done on my own. I'm very, very good at it, but I'm really terrible at marketing. It's not something I enjoy. It's not something I have any interest in. So partnering, particularly one of the partnerships, she's really good at marketing. So we always make money. So that's always nice. <laughs> everything else is like, man, I make, nice. I make, I make all of my money based on my private stuff. Like everything else I just kind of output <laughs> and mm -hmm. And how it goes. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. I'm like, here, here. Sure. <laughs> no, I, I output. I'm the one that I provide money and oh, then output. these products get made. Uh, now I get cool. you. Now I get you. <laughs> <laughs> Not only content creation, but the money behind the content creation. <laughs> mm -hmm. so I'm like, Jim, you don't need a you don't need a photographer. I got a photographer. Come on, Jim. <laughs> I know this. you can't tell me how like, I can't tell you how, like what I like. I was like, oh my god, that's amazing. <laughs> The network of people. <laughs> <laughs> but on the flip side, like being with like the energy that gets behind a project when you're working with a partner for me is huge. Like I like that. Like I said, I'll complete stuff on my own. I am that person. But kind of getting that energy is really, really nice. And then where do I want to be in four years or three years or one year or mm -hmm. whatever? Um mm -hmm. Where are, you, where are you trying to get to? What 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 is the eventual like sustainable point of like what you're doing on a, a typical basis to earn your income? I, I will always do privates. I would love to not have all of my income based on privates. I still do a little bit of lecturing for the Naval Postgraduate School. I've actually applied at a lot of colleges in the Portland area as like an adjunct mm -hmm. professor. We'll see if anybody takes me up on it. One of the hardest parts within what I do, and this might be helpful for people listening, I don't have a niche. If you are a yoga teacher or a parkour person or a Pilates person or you're a sports performance person, you have a niche. When you're just a general movement person, you don't have a niche. So pitching yourself is really hard. And it's hmm. something I run into all of the time. I'm like, okay, I can teach a workshop for you. I'll reach out to some, you know, some place. And they're like, well, what's it on? And I try to explain it how's that going to help our people? And I explain it, but we do this year. Mm -hmm. You don't do that. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, I've studied that. I just don't do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and it's, and it, it's wild though. The community is in the sameness. It's like, no, no, no. We want you to do what we do and like, get us to do what we do better. And then you like pause and you're like, well, if that was the answer, wouldn't you be better? Wouldn't you not need, like, sorry to be like, it's wild. It's wild. What and people. it was way better over in Europe. People were way more open-minded over in Europe. I reached out mm -hmm. to a lot of different places and people were like, yes, of course, that would be amazing. Let's learn like a different perspective on things. So that was really cool to see that it's not, it's that the U.S. is kind of special in some way. Mm. <laughs> so I would, uh, to answer, I guess that the short answer to your question was I would love to be teach lecturing in some capacity somewhere. And I also also like to be teaching more comprehensive curriculum somewhere in terms of movement mm -hmm. and then still doing privates. That's what I would love. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, I'm listening to you and I'm like, I'm like PE, but also not at all PE. It's like a whole different world. You're like, Oh, you just want to look at birds today. Like, okay. Tell me about. <laughs> to me. So uh, the PE. So if I, if I even pull this together, like I still, consider myself as long as people let me do and study what I want to study which is the kids like it like I see myself teaching PE continued I actually like it takes an awful lot out of me 
to do PE the way I do PE, which is a very much an interactive, like you're touching base with all 40 of these kids. Um, and a lot of them who don't want to touch base, you got to learn them to learn their language, to what they like. So it takes a lot out of me to do it. So I don't really like to do one-on-ones because it takes from my rest time. Um, Mm -hmm. But in, in that same, I see myself doing it. Um, I see myself continuing the PE realm, Uh, maybe way out there. If anybody cared enough type about PE, which I don't see it happening. I see PE probably going away in a lot of, which is so wild when you see what the kids, if you were like observe the kids Mm. and like how they move and what they are just like, I can't believe, but I very much see PE potentially going away. Um, And then I guess if that were to happen, I would probably do more of, uh, I think also instead of one-on-ones, it would be like, how do I reach more people? Um, Just more thinking behind things and and processes versus like protocols and how you come up with that. Um, Yeah, that's kind of, I also think with like TM is really like doing stuff with think movement. Because again, as a solo, and I think that's the thing is we all got our jam and, you know, I mentioned this in our, in our first uh, little get together, but like, there's something about looking outside your workshop and inviting people in who are interested and curious that, like you said, really makes you better at figuring out how to communicate what you do. And I'll be forever grateful for the kids who come to my class who could care less and are kind of knuckleheads because it makes me have to dig deeper, like, okay, these guys get it, but those three back there, I got to find another way. So they just keep expanding how I'm able to try and connect with people. So I hope, you know, for for the future of Think Movement that we are able to get uh, the people in it who are doing in this process of building their own businesses, be able to come together and chat about things in a safe way, but also in like a challenging way, like not the like, you're doing great, but like, no, 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 ask the hard questions. Like not like, again, I guess that will be the Europe of of something that happens where people are open-minded and maybe this person sees something I don't and they're not here to criticize me, but they're able to make me better. So really cultivating this as a safe space, I think uh, will be really important in the years to come. So yeah. Yeah, Sounds good. Uh, I think with that, we'll probably, let's conclude uh, round one uh, of this business chat we'll we'll see how far it goes um but any final thoughts from either of you two before we sign off uh no i think i mean i think some good points were brought up you know like i think this the, this last one where you know that jen was talking about how there's this can sometimes be this like single mindedness of like this is my goal but understanding how that value whether it applies in like a business context or in an actual training context like you know jen or you or i could help you work towards somebody's same goal in completely different ways and probably still help them get there you know what i mean so yeah um these different perspectives are are super important and that being said it is also important i think to have somewhere that you are trying to go whether or not that's where you want to keep going after a month or however long but I think that was a big thing in for me with the business side too like or taking like the parkour context of like finding the path you know from the business side is like understanding um that I didn't like marketing or I wasn't good at this or or learning how to be more confident as like Jen was mentioning like it was a big thing I was like a huge anti-social loner type kid and and trying to realize and understand like was that part of like an identity that I wanted to continue to cultivate or was that just something that I had like become due to or due to you know environmental circumstances and stuff like that and realizing it was not only like better for me from a life context to become more like outgoing or able to have conversations but it's like better business when you can talk <laughs> with somebody yeah. remote and <laughs> tell them about this thing you're passionate about so it's it's um, um or, or there's the side of it where you're just like yeah no I don't want to deal with that at all so let me find like someone else that does or how I can like mm-hmm. offload that to somebody else or to or find the find the other path right I I, I think that's like to synthesize what you just said, there is a whole lot of good 
can put good anywhere you want and opening up the introvert like mm-hmm. so much so much for the introvert so much for for the interaction between for the sharing of ideas for the thinking uh and that might be the the general i didn't even know it but i'm like it could be what this is for so, <laughs> Uh, any last words from you, Jen? I will say that when you look back on your business history, you look back on any history, right? You'll see patterns like I certainly do. And when you see the patterns, you have a choice. Do you continue with the patterns or do you make a change and do something different? 100%. Yeah. So I strongly, like if someone's struggling in business, I strongly encourage that for you. And, mm-hmm. and instead of repeat, in case it's not clear, like make a pivot. Make a pivot, have, have, have a safe hand somewhere and make a pivot and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Well, cool. Well, thank you guys so very much. I appreciate you. We'll chat a little bit more after I stop recording. (laughs) 